Welcome. In today's lesson, we will be learning the how of programming by reviewing code examples that demonstrate the ways we can work with recursion, iteration, and generators. So recursion is defined as something that calls itself, and we're going to look at a couple examples that demonstrate a factorial and a Fibonacci sequence return. Then using classic iteration and getting the same result as recursion, then compare the difference. And finally, we're going to talk about generators. Now, generators are an entirely different type of object in Python, and they're very powerful because they have the ability to generate their returns each sequential step, which allows us to pause or halt the system in many different places. And that can be a really powerful thing. We're going to look at the time it takes to execute generators. We're going to show a couple examples of generators and traditional looping iteration. So get ready because this is going to be an exciting lesson that hopefully is explained clearly enough that you don't have to iterate over it too many times. Let's start talking about recursion. Let's start talking about recursion. Let's start talking about recursion in the sense of factorials. So here is what makes recursion recursion. It has a mini version of itself inside of its own logic. It is a tricky thing to get your head around, but the important way to look at it syntactically is when you see the name of a function up here repeated again somewhere inside of the logic. But another way to think about them is that they're sort of stacking on top of one another in sort of a pyramid shape. So when we look for factorial 5, we then need to wait for a whole new function, which is actually getting the input of 4 instead of 5 to find its answer, which is then waiting for a whole new function, which gets the input of 3, not 5 or 4, to get its answer. And then when it finally gets to the answer, when it finally gets a 1 input and it gets a return, then it solves this one, which solves this one, which solves this one, which solves this one back up the chain. So the way to look at this inside is usually with an if else, we're saying finally if you get to the input of one, we have an actual answer for you. But other than that, we're just explaining the logic that's going to get you to the answer no matter how far out you are from the number one. And you can see that right here. We're taking the number n, which we're going to put in as five, could be any number, and then we're multiplying it by this exact same function, but that function is taking in the number 5 minus 1, and so on, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Let's just run this, and you can see that each time we printed, each time it made one of these, we had a different print statement here, so even though you see one print statement, we do get it printed out five times, because each time was a whole different function. This whole function is inside of just this call to another whole function, which has a call to another whole function. So that is how you think of recursion and why it's different than traditional looping. So now let's show another example. Instead of the factorial example, I'm looking to create Fibonacci. If you don't remember the Fibonacci sequence, it's one plus one is two, and then one plus two is three, and then two plus three is five. So one of the ways we can do this using recursion is by calling a function that is decremented by one and then adding it to another function that's decremented by two. We're running this exact same process we're saying to get this answer, first put in that one and that one. And then to get that answer, put in that one and that one. So you can see we can actually run this, let me get this thing out of the way. You can see we can actually run this function multiple times. So each one of these is a separate call. But I wanted to show you that it does make the pattern. If we recall the first place, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so on in the list. So you can see that we can get it that way. But another, another example of being able to find the actual function with some kind of different argument inside of the exact same function with the original argument and then something modifying it down there. Okay, so that is recursion in a nutshell. Nutshell, nutshell, nutshell. Now let's talk about iteration, because iteration is a more abstract notion in the same way recursion is. It's a conceptual thing that goes beyond just Python or a single programming language. And iteration is simply the process of doing something to every element in some kind of a sequence. I always think of it in my head first as a list, a list of items, and you're doing something to all of them. Like if you have an actual notepad, like a physical to-do list, I consider that iteration when you cross out each item when they're done. You say, is this item done? You do the logic and then you cross it out. But that pattern of crossing out happens the exact same way to every element on your list, every to-do that you finish. So the way we would define this, and this is just a reminder that that's what the Fibonacci sequence output is that we're looking for. So this function, this iteration version of the Fibonacci sequence is a little bit different. You can see that we start with two assigned variables, a and b, 0 and 1, 
And then we say for i in the range of 0 through n. So this is going to make a list, because we need a list to iterate over, that's as long as the number that we input. So in this case, it's a list that's one long. In this case, it's a list that's six long. And then what we do is we take that list. And then the logic that we use on every single item is that we make the item A the equivalent of what was B. And now we change B to what is A plus B. And that does the same thing as A plus B. And then it becomes A. A plus B becomes A. And we can do the exact same thing to get the Fibonacci sequence, just as we expected. The 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and the 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 up here. Maybe that gives you a little bit more of a sense of what it's like to work with iteration versus recursion. Let's talk about generators. This is a very powerful object inside of Python for its ability to work asynchronously, for its ability to pause its state. Let me just show you a traditional example of a loop that has the logic for squaring, because we're going to use this as a comparison for the generator one next. Just to remember how this works, we have a function, it's called loop squares. We're going to pass in these numbers, and then each number is going to get squared by itself, and then it's going to be appended to a list. So we have to start with a blank list. We have to run through each of the items, like in the way we just talked about in an iterative way, iteration. And then on each iteration, we are going to append that result and then return the final list when we're done. So we run these two cells and we get exactly what we think. I did a type check here on the return numbers. It's a list. And then there is the list itself. So now let's look at how we would do that exact same thing with a generator in less lines of code and arguably in a more powerful way, depending on your use case. So this generator version does the same thing by starting a function. And it has the same inputs, and we're going to input the same numbers. We have four i and nums, which is the same as up here for each number that we have in the list. And it does take a list. We can't just put in the number five and it makes its own, although we could build it that way. But the point is it needs a list at this point before the yield statement. And then the yield statement, which you haven't seen before, a brand new keyword, is the equivalent of the logic, in this case append, but any other kind of logic too, and the return all wrapped into one. But it's a special type of return because it's not just returning any object. It is returning a generator object. The yield keyword is crucial for returning a generator object. What we're saying is don't just return any variable like a normal return can. We need you to send back an actual generator type of a variable. And because of that, we have the ability to keep some of the logic inside of it and execute it one by one. So what I mean by that is that if we run this function and then we look at the output, we actually have a generator object. Now remember before, we actually got back our list, and by printing the list, we printed the list. When we try to print the generator, we just print something that says, I am a generator. We don't actually print out all of these numbers. They're sort of unprocessed. They're more raw, you could say. And the reason why they're more raw is because we need another function after that to push through each step. So the logic for 2 times 2, which was done and then appended to this, has not been done yet. It's actually the logic. 2 times 2 is inside of the yield statement. It's inside of our object right here. So when we say next and then we look at the generator object that we got out, then we find our first result. So the number 4 comes out. And finally, only at this point, have we processed 2 times 2. So sitting in here, in the next step in the generator, is 3 times 3. It hasn't been done yet. But by calling the next function, we get it, 9, and so on, down to 16. So that's the difference, is it's bringing in the entire logic and waiting to execute it until the time is right. And there's certain reasons why working asynchronously is powerful, like something with a server where you're waiting for a response from someone, or there's some kind of thing that needs to happen before the logic is processed. So you can see how powerful they are. Another thing about them is supposedly they're a lot faster. Okay, now I'm going to be real upfront that these tests are not demonstrating what I read. I think I'm on the right track when guiding you this way, but I want you to be aware that I'm not solid on exactly why these times are coming out the way they are. When we use our timer function in Jupyter, what we'll see is the amount of time it takes to create this function, and then down here, how much time it takes to call it. And they're doing the same thing. They're both processing the same list, the numbers 2 through 6, 
and they're doing the same logic, the multiplication here. So arguably, one of the main reasons you would use a generator is because it saves time. It's not going to be as computationally heavy. It doesn't need to run through the entire list. You can run through it piece by piece on an as-needed basis. But beyond that, I actually thought that doing the generator by itself would be faster, like it's just a more efficient way all around to handle it. But with a use case this small, it comes out to be about the same amount of CPU cycle. So you might not see it, but I did want to show you how we could run something like this. So you can see up here on the wall time, it took 3.1. This is mu s, which I'm going to assume is milliseconds, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But 3.1 for up here, and then it took 3.1 for down here. So creating the function, putting the yield logic together, or in this case, running the loop and appending all the logic to the answer, they took the same amount of time. But now when it actually comes to calling the function down here and processing the list, you'll see that it took 5.1, and down here it only took 4.05. So even though we have all of these calls, it's kind of amazing. Like next generate object, next generate object, which we think take more time. It's like starting and stopping all of this over and over again. You know, they do come out being more efficient as a whole. So my point is, if you're gonna be working with a gigantic data set and down the road when you're, you know, a real high paid programmer and you're doing crazy stuff with big data sets, you should revisit the concept of whether you should use a generator and see if there might be ways to get more computational gains out of it. As a beginner, it's not a thing to worry about, but it is a thing to know that there is time differences between the way we write code. Just one more example, it's just a different version of kind of what we started with, but I wanna make sure that you see the difference in the yield statements. And I found out that surprisingly, my name backwards is super cool, and I was really proud of that and wanted to share it with you. We have a couple different functions here, one that's going to use a generator and one that's going to use a regular loop. So in this one, we're going to be importing a string of characters. In fact, my name, D-Y-L-A-N. It's going to be an argument that passes through here. We're going to get a number from this, the amount of letters minus one. So we have, we have five characters here. So this is going to return the number five, but then we're going to decrement it by one. So we end up with four in here. Here, we're going to create a brand new list, an empty list with no items inside of it. And then we're going to make a loop. And we're going to say, while the count, and this count up here is four, is greater than negative one, then I want you to append something to this list. And that thing that you'll be appending is the text count. So it will be this, and then in the slicing bracket, it will be this count. So it'll start with five, and then four. So what it'll be doing is appending that letter, then that letter, then that letter, each to this list. So this list is gonna grow from being empty to being this, but it's gonna work backwards and reverse my name. And then just to make sure that our while loop does eventually end, we take this count variable here and we decrement it by one using our shorthand notation, our shorthand assignment notation right there. Because this is a word, this is a string, we wanna create a blank string called new, and we wanna join this new list onto here. But we totally could just return the list too, but it just makes more sense, I think, in this case to make it a string. Dylan backwards is nailed. Like, my name is nailed. Like, nailed it, Dylan. Pretty cool, I think. But let's look at it in generator version. So here we have the same thing reversed. We're gonna pass in an argument. We have the exact same argument, except we're making it into a generator and then running through each part of the generator using an outside for loop. Our inside for loop here, meaning inside of our function. So this is quite a bit different looking, but I wanted to compare the two so you could see that they actually could be interchangeable. We could use a for loop up here instead of a while loop. It would just look different. So I wanted you to maybe play with these two and kind of get your head around why they're different, but why they kind of work the same. And here we're taking that same string that comes in, my name, D-Y-L-A-N, and we're breaking it down into how many letters it is using the len function. So we end up with five. And then we are minusing one in the same way we did, in the same way we did up here. So we end up with four. But then you'll notice these other two minus ones, which are pretty unusual. So these allow it to loop around and then also to skip in increments of one. So if you remember back to when we worked with our range function in loops, the range had a start, a stop, 
and it had a step function. So we can use all of those in this to create the kind of range that we need. So a little bit different than the count approach, but it works. And then when we're in here, we do a very simple piece of logic. Instead of needing append, which is only a method of the list out that we had before, we can just yield the logic itself, which is slice this right up and then put this into a yield statement piece by piece so we can get it out later. So when we run this, you'll see that we get the exact same thing. And in this case, we're getting it back out as a generator, so we don't need it as a list or a string. But you can see it totally worked. So we ran the function, we saved the return into a generator because we know it's a generator object, and generator objects can be looped over. So we just said for i in gen, print i. And then all of a sudden, you get nailed. Thanks. Nailed it. All right, you lovely generator people who know about recursion and iteration, thanks for listening and enjoy the next lesson. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.